All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the Melbourne Business Network's second webinar with Northbridge Capital. In this session, we'll focus on capital raising. We have a lot of content to get through, but before we get started, I've just got a few items of housekeeping. First of all, my name is Wendy Dawson and I'm the president of the Melbourne Business Network. The MBN is a not-for-profit business networking association which has been operating since 1994. Our focus is to facilitate connections, communication and collaboration with businesses across Melbourne through face-to-face -face networking activities and the B3000 Awards program. However, just like you, in these unprecedented times, we've had to look at the way we do business, move online and network in different ways. Although this is a virtual event, we do encourage networking, so please copy and paste your LinkedIn URL into the chat box. Be sure to connect with one another on LinkedIn, set up virtual coffees and strike up a conversation with other like-minded business people. You will have noticed that you've come into the webinar with your microphones off. This is to prevent any background noises as we get started. Although this is a virtual gathering, we believe that an official recognition of the traditional owners is as relevant in the opening of a webinar as it is an opening of an in-person gathering. And so in the spirit of reconciliation, the Melbourne Business Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. There will no doubt be a number of questions that arise during this presentation. Bradley and Basil have asked that we hold off all questions until the end. However, do type them into the chat box so that I can collate these for them. A little bit about, a little bit about our presenters. Bradley Birchall, with a diverse range of experience as an entrepreneur, founder, CEO and CIO of various successful companies, including Seek and ComputerShare, Bradley has launched and worked with many successful startups, raised millions of dollars, and rapidly grown tech startups from zero to hero. Bradley regularly advises companies on international growth, capital raising, marketing, and technology. Our second presenter is Basil Tambanis, an accomplished executive director and corporate advisor with 20 years of experience building, growing, leading multi-million dollar organizations. With, with extensive capital raising experience, both as an advisor and serial entrepreneur, Basil understands the complexities involved in creating scalable, profitable and sustainable businesses that maximize shareholder return. Okay. Over to you, Bradley. Thank you, Wendy. Um, as everyone will be aware that attended the last session, we talked about the seven foundations for startup success and capital racing. And one of the key things that we covered in the last session was about getting the business model pitch right. And Northbridge Capital, have offered a two hour session to the winner of the person that could actually pitch and present their business model in under five minutes. And so I'm happy to announce that Joanne Amelan from the Vocational Le Language and Learning Centre was our prize winner. So congratulations on that, Joanne. Uh, we'll be in touch with you and we'll organise a private session for you. So thank you again, everyone that participated in that giveaway. And without further ado, I will hand over to Basil Tambanis, who is going to kick off the second session, which is focusing on investing. Good afternoon. Well, I'm glad that everyone's been able to find some time to attend uh, instead of reaching for a beer or reaching for a webinar. So I'll make it as valuable as possible. I think this is um, an incredibly important part of any startup journey. And what we're going to go through tonight is essentially 25 to 30 years of work that I've done in this space. And I'd like to be able to share with you some of my learnings 
leave you with some tools, tips and techniques to um, use in your own business, whether it's a startup or mature business, and hopefully uh, make it a lot easier for you to get that next round of capital away. So today we have a lot of ground to cover. We've probably jammed too much into this, but we wanted to make sure that everyone had a really good high level understanding of capital raising and um, and what's uh, what are the major pitfalls, what's required, how to get investor ready, uh, a little bit about investors. Uh, and we've saved the best till last. Um, we're going to give you a capital raising strategy to take away so that you feel that um, you can try this out um, before you actually have to go and do it for real. So <clears throat> capital raising is not all about getting money in the door and it doesn't have to be uh, purely a stressful exercise. There are a lot of benefits to capital raising. It allows you to see your business through the lens of an investor. So, you know, you get a free critique of your business uh, from someone that's looking to invest, which is incredibly valuable. Uh, you get feedback from experts. You validate the assumptions that you've used to build your business model. Um, and other people get to identify weaknesses in your business business so you can strengthen them. And look, at the end of the day, if you get the right sh uh, shareholders, uh, you can move forward with a stronger um, sh stronger register and a stronger board. So typically, this is what um, most startups and, and businesses think about raising capital. You know, um, we're here to demystify it. And look, I think um, it is a very complex strategic process, uh, but it's easily learnt um, and we'll endeavour to make it a lot more simple today. So let's start with a lot of the key mistakes people make um, and make sure that they're on the radar so that we don't, don't make them moving forward. The, the biggest single mistake that people make is not being prepared. So they're focused on their business. Uh, they're really trying to build um, uh, a business on a, on a shoestring budget, bootstrapping their business, um, and they try and do the capital raise as an afterthought. It doesn't work that way. So what happens if you're not prepared? You only get one shot at pitching to good investors. Uh, if you don't put your best foot forward, typically, um, you know, you will not secure the better quality investors that you're looking for. You get distracted from your business for a long time. I've seen people who thought they'd be raising money for three or four months and it's taken 18 months. So you're spending a lot of time focused on, on raising capital when you should be building a business. And it puts a lot of pressure uh, on your team. If your team feel that you're running out of money and they can't fund the business going forward uh, and they've got commitments that they have to fund, uh, it can be very distracting and um, yeah, in, in some instances you lose good people. Um, and reputational damage. You've been in the market for a long time trying to raise money and investors find out that you've been in the, in the market for 12 months and you still haven't raised money. Their assumption is it's not a great investment. So uh, that all falls out of not being prepared. So it's important to get investor ready understand what information investors require, uh, how they need that information provided to them, and surround yourself with the right people that you need, uh, mentors, advisors, lawyers, and accountants. And um, there are probably as many advisors and lawyers and accountants as there are startups. So make sure you pick uh, those groups that have a track record of working with startups. So, uh, if this is the first capital raise for you, um, or even one of just a few, where do you start? I would suggest talking to 20 founders who have been through the process a couple of times and ask them where they went wrong, where they went right. Um, do the same with investors. Ask investors in your space you know, what their key criteria are, what they look for, what they like, what they don't like. And again, um, talk to some lawyers and advisors in terms of what they can do for you and get uh, an indicative understanding of what they 
uh, can deliver at what cost. So I'm just going to run very quickly through some of the key pitfalls. Last week we touched on, on vision and having a clear vision for the business. I'm going to do it again because it's in, uh, particularly important that you get this right. So what is the big picture? What's the business going to look like at the end of the day that you're trying to build? Um, how do you get there? How long does it take? And how much will it cost you? So in a snapshot, uh, this is a timeline that allows you to present something to an investor to say uh, that that section in yellow, which is traction to date, demonstrates that you can do and say what you're going to do. And then the orange posts are all key milestones. So uh, for every milestone, there will be smaller black activity items. And each one of those should uh, increase the value of your business. It might be one milestone might be getting a product to market. The next milestone might be uh, getting into uh, a different geographic market or adding features. Uh, but all of these key milestones should be set out, uh, understood what it takes in terms of time and money uh, and activities to reach each one and lay them out for an investor to understand what your plan is. And as you go from left to right, um, you're hitting more milestones, increasing the value of your business, and uh, you're decreasing the risk of the investment to the investor as you move forward. And we'll go into this a little bit later, but I wanted just to, um, to provide you with this slide again. So now that we mapped out the plan in the last slide, in reality, never works out that way, but you do need some pegs uh, in the ground to make sure that you can show investors where you're going, how you're going to, to get there. Uh, and really what this slide represents is things don't go to plan. So when they don't, if you don't hit a milestone, uh, for whatever reason, it may take you longer or you've run out of money, you really need to, to be able to articulate to investors, uh, this is where we're at. Uh, we didn't hit our target or meet our milestone, but this is how we're going to do it. So it's important to understand, well, if you don't, uh, what's the next steps and how's that going to impact the business and investors? Additional key uh, pitfalls or, or mistakes that people make is um, people fall in love with what they're doing and they don't test the market. So they, they build a solution looking for a problem. And when they go to take that product to market, they find out, there's not a need for that product that can support a growing scalable business. The other pitfall is taking a weak team to investors. Um, the, the team makes a big part, probably factors over 70% of an investor making a decision uh, to put money into your business or not. So it's important that you get the team right. Um, you've done inadequate research uh, or you don't know your customer or market well enough. So we see very regularly um, people trying to put business models together and their go-to-market strategy and then recognise that they really don't know enough about how to price the product, they haven't got that feedback from the market, they haven't segmented the market properly uh, and it's a it's a big issue for a lot of uh, startups. That um, you're going to investors and you can't demonstrate any traction. So if you can't show them that you've been able to bootstrap or do something with your own funding uh, prior to coming to them, uh, it doesn't give them a lot of confidence to move forward with you. And one of the big ticket items for a lot of companies is that they overvalue their business at an early stage and they can't support it with metrics. And other mistakes that we commonly see that are important to, to understand are that when you're going out for investment, you target the wrong investors. Not all investors are the same. They have different criteria. They have different interests. And some are bound by um, uh, investment criteria that, that, that your company will not be able to match. So understand who can and can't invest and which ones are good investors and which ones aren't. Um, 
a lot of the time when an investor comes in to do their due diligence, they find out there's conflict between the, the um, founders. And as soon as they see that, uh, it makes them very uncomfortable and most likely will want to walk away. A lack of focus. You're trying to do too many things in the business, um, all of which soak up a lot of your attention, but um, you do a lot of things poorly and, and nothing particularly well. Um, and you've started off with a capital structure. You've already taken on investment um, or you've got you've mismanaged your shareholding. Um, and typically that is you've either issued too many shares or you've brought on an investor that uh, will put a ceiling on the valuation because they are a potential acquirer. Uh, so don't bring in a major competitor to what you're doing or someone that uh, can stop uh, other people coming in and acquiring the business. And uh, when you raise your, or when you go to investors and say, we want to raise $1 million, and they find out that the use of funds is not really going to help them uh, in that it doesn't build value of the business, it, the money's channeled into areas that don't support growth. And this includes paying out uh, founder's debt or anyone else's debt. So be careful that um, you can um, not fall into this trap. A little bit about investors. It's important to put yourself in the shoes of investors. Often, uh, you know, they it's not their money they're investing. They're custodians of other people's money. Um, so they're benchmarked, measured and uh, on their performance. So they really have to get it right. They're typically uh, lied to by serial entrepreneurs or startup founders every day. So they're skeptical at best. Generally, they know that you're telling what, whatever you're telling them is half true. It's going to take twice as long and twice as much money. So understand that um, building credibility and trust with an investor is paramount. Make sure that you don't tell any pork pies or overstretch, uh, you know, any of the metrics that you, you're trying to achieve. Uh, they see a lot of deal flow um, every day and you're just one of many. Uh, it's important that you get to know them well before you ask for money. Have at least two or three discussions with them, understand what's important to them, tell them a little bit about what you're doing so when you next go to see them, you can demonstrate uh, your traction since you last spoke and it gives them confidence that you're on the right path, you're doing what you can do what you say you can do, and the um, founder execution risk is low or relatively low. And look, a lot of people forget that investors are going to be with you for a long time and you with them. So the journey is typically four to eight years. Um, so you have to understand that uh, you need to build that relationship through ups and downs and make sure that they're the right investor for you. If their time horizon is two to three years, um, it's going to be a very difficult journey for you. Lastly, and I can't stress this enough, is be very careful about uh, selecting your investors. The wrong investors uh, will unwind your business. You will fail, and many companies do, because of the wrong investors. If they're not aligned, they don't have the same motivation as you or the time horizon, uh, or want to get too involved uh, when they shouldn't, uh, then it can spell disaster. So that's a very important point to understand. So in recapping, what's important to investors? The quality of the team, the size of the market. Is the market big enough for you, for you to grow a large enough business that's going to give them the return that they're looking for. Um, how do you compete uh, in the marketplace? Do you have a competitive advantage? Um, is the business model right? Does it allow you to, to scale and grow a company through to exit? And do you have good technology or IP that gives you an advantage over others? And then you need to take all of this information and demonstrate that you know your numbers. I would say nine out of 10 startups do not know their numbers. They try to present something that looks plausible and very quickly through due diligence, investors walk away because 
uh, they can't support their numbers. And um, you need to know, in, in, in essence, some foundational numbers, which are your burn rate, understand your cash flows and what they'll look like over time and when you need to go back and, and raise more money. Uh, and how these, um, how the growth of your business uh, can be measured and tracked over time. So, as it's important for investors to ask you questions, it's also important for you to do your due diligence on investors and ask them questions. What type, and, and I'll run through a few quickly, what type of companies do they prefer to invest in? You know, at what stages of companies' life cycle do they invest? How much can they invest? Can they invest follow-on rounds so that uh, they, they can support you as you grow? Um, do they bring on other investors and co-investors that uh, they work with? How active are they? Are they passive or do they like to roll up their sleeves and get involved? Do they have any experience in, in the industry that you're in and uh, can they help or uh, what can they bring to the table that's not just money? Um, and do they require some sort of involvement on the board? So these are all questions that you should ask uh, investors. So um, capital raising strategy. This is um, something that's worked for, for me and for Brad for over 20 years. I raised $40 million in my own company using this strategy. And you can take this away with you today uh, and work through it and you will get a lot of benefits from understanding the strategy, the engineering and how to put it into place. So. Um, make no mistake, fundraising is absolutely strategic. It needs to be uh, engineered and designed and well executed. And what this looks like in practice is, uh, if I'm going to the market, whether it's for the first time as a starter or whether it's for my 25th placement as an ASX listed company, I always identify who the, in, the best investors for my business would be and who I'd want. I build relationships with them early before I needed the money. I would get investor ready and then I would look to raise an amount uh, that meets the, the, the company's criteria whereby you know that you're going to get an uplift in value from what you're doing and then investors feel like their money has been used to increase the value of their investment. I would test, refine your model pitch and financials with people that uh, are low priority investors that you typically wouldn't want on the register, but go to them in any case, test out your pitch, let them find the holes, make sure that you plug all the holes and then go back to the market knowing full well that you can answer any questions, you're well prepared and you've got a, a pretty strong pitch to move forward with. I'd obtain the easy 10 to 20 percent of the raise through friends, family, friendly investors that you know. Uh, and then once you can demonstrate that you've got a little bit of funding on board, secure an investor uh, that's well respected and we call them lead investors someone that, who's well recognised at making investments in your industry uh, that uh, have been successful in making investments so that it sends a signal to the investment market that, you know, there's a pretty savvy investor on board. If they're on board, uh, it's worth looking at. And a lot of the time when investors are sitting on the fence and they see a lead investor who's well recognised uh, and successful, it will be enough to tip them over to making an investment. So at this stage, you have a lead investor uh, who's put some money in. You've got 10 to 20% of early investors that you know put some money in. And then you go into the market targeting those investors at the same time. So you might have 25 investors that you're going to go to. You go to them all in the same week. You explain to them that you've got 40 to 50% of the uh, raise completed, and this is your lead investor. Uh, and then you ask them to put in their bids or 
or, or make their offers. And uh, that strategy sounds simple, um, and it is, but uh, it has some significant benefits and most people don't do this. The outcome of that strategy gives you optionality. So you've targeted all of your investors at once so that you know that you can pick and choose the good from the bad. If you just do this piecemeal and someone offers you, uh, if you go to one person at a time and one this week and one in two weeks' time and someone makes an offer, uh, you're sort of stuck. You either have to say no or yes, I'll take it. But with all of those investors coming back to you at the same time, you can pick and choose. For those really good investors that have offered you a term sheet that's pretty hard to live with, uh, you may be able to use um, this competitive advantage to reduce uh, some of their terms or make them a bit more friendly. There's competitive tension in the marketplace, so investors just can't sit back and say, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision later. They, if they want to be in it, they have to make a decision before the round closes. It's much more time efficient for you. It can save you six to 12 months um, if you follow this process. So I've covered through, I've covered a lot of information. Um, you'll probably go home and, and you know, 90% of it will, uh, uh, you know, be forgotten in three days. So we've set this exercise up for you to take home if you like, and we'd be very happy for you to pitch it back to us when you've done it. But take your own business or your own startup and set up this timeline milestones uh, and activities and walk through what this would look like. Where, what sort of business do you want to build? At the end of the, the, at the time when you, uh, when you want to exit this business, what's it going to look like? What's the revenue? How many employees? Uh, what sort of uh, target markets are you in? Are you uh, in any offshore companies? So just think about what sort of company it is that you want to build and then work backwards. Peg in the milestones that you would need to put in place to get to that end journey point. So, and then for each of those key milestones, what are the activities that need to take place to get there? What funding and what skills do you need and put a cash flow against it um, and work out where the next fundraising needs to come in. Uh, always, give yourself, uh, always give yourself six months of, of runway to, um, to plan for the next raise. And, and that'll paint a bit of a picture for you in terms of uh, where you want to go, how to get there. It might refine... Uh, a few things for you and, and change the way that you're looking at this business. And we use this for our elevator pitch. Um, and we also use it in a full blown pitch, uh, pitch deck. So this is essentially can be uh, concentrated or extrapolated as much as you like, but it's a very valuable tool. Okay, I might hand over for question time. Um, and I'll hand over to Brad. Thanks, Basil. Wendy, um, I think, is there anything that you wanted to say before we hand? Yeah, I do. So I think in terms of the, you know, I don't, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So do investors actually have money? Is it a good time to be seeking capital funds? Okay, I might answer that. Um. Investors, are, before we hit this pandemic, a lot of people were cashed up. You know, people, all the savvy investors and family officers could see us slipping into potential recession and they cashed up. So uh, there is a lot of money there looking for good investments. There is always money for a good investment. Um, my brother is the MD of a company. They are... Uh, just about to put out a prospectus uh, next week or the week after. They went to raise 20 million. They're oversubscribed by $20 million. So depending on what the sector is, if you're trying to raise money for tourism right now or um, anything that's been significantly impacted by the pandemic, uh, then I would say it's a difficult sell. 
uh, if you're in one of those sectors that um, hasn't been hit by the pandemic and maybe, you know, you're in video conferencing technology, for example, uh, you might be on a winner. Uh, it really depends on how solid your offering is uh, and what sector you're in. What are, and we've talked a little bit about this offline in terms of, you know, when you are a startup or an entrepreneur, you are so in love with your business and with your idea and all of that. And getting back to from the investor point of view, they get lied to every day. What are the some of the, the most common delusions that we as startups or entrepreneurs need to check ourselves with before we before we engage. I think I might take that one. Um, so the the most common uh, sort of mistake that that we see from an investor perspective is that um, probably overly optimistic valuations is it would be number one, but it's almost on a par with. Um, a lack of actual information behind the the customer and the market. And so what we covered in our first session where we talked about the actual knowledge that you need to have as a founder about your customer and their demographics and the actual market itself. And so what we find is that a lot of investors, um, uh, uh, you know, concerned about the presentation that they're given because when they start to drill into the detail around financials, there's not a lot of substance in the numbers. And so it's not good enough to simply say, look, the market size is in Australia, uh, you know, 5 million people, right? Uh, and we're going to get 5% of that market. That's what we call in the industry a top-down approach. And so the top-down approach is, is definitely something you want to avoid. You need to be thinking about real numbers. So that 5 million people, how does that break down into the demographic that's your customer? And then how are you actually going to reach them? You know, are you going to reach them through social media? Is it going to be through LinkedIn or Facebook? Or are you going to have a sales team? And so it all comes back to understanding the customer and the numbers in the market and then how you're going to reach them. They sort of build up on top of each other. We've got, um, I've had a, a question come through to me directly from Tabitha. What happens if the end game for the business is just to sell a big player, or excuse me, to a big player? Do people who you approach for funding like this model or not? I'll take the question. Uh, if I can just confirm that the end game is to be able to sell your product or service to a large uh, multinational or a large company, is that correct? So uh, if I was uh, in um, textiles and clothing, I'd want to be able to sell to the major retailers, or something like that. Um, is, did, have I heard the question correctly? And apologies, and apologies Tabitha. Tabitha. Yeah, and she said, yes, that's correct. What had happened is this chat box had moved on me. And, yeah. um, and um, so then I was trying to play catch up. But it's what happens if the end game for the business is just to sell to a big player? Do people okay. who you approach for funding like this model or not? Yeah. Okay. So can you hear me? Fine? Okay. So this really comes down, Tabitha, to your vision and mission that you set out with. Not all businesses try to maximise return on investment, but inherently most do. And so if, you are, if your objective is to present um, your product to a large player in the industry or two large players that dominate a particular industry, I think I'd say a couple of things. One is that you're at incredible risk if most of your revenue is coming from one um, one source. 
And for whatever reason, there's a, new, there's a change of management at that company or a, a departure from their current sort of thinking of wanting to sell your product. You could go from having the 90% of your revenue, you know, uh, vaporize if, if that particular group didn't want to um, buy your product anymore. So from an investment point of view, it's quite risky to have all your revenues with one player. So um, Tabitha, frequently when I was uh, advising listed businesses, uh, we would have clients who come in and say, we're selling to Maya, we're selling to David Jones. And I'd look at the breakup of their revenue and the quality of their revenue. And the first thing that we would say to them is, we are concerned that if one of these players decided not to sell your product, uh, that it would decimate your business. So um, that's, you know, that's coming from, 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 a, from an investor risk point of view, and it's all about risk return. Um, if you were never intending to sell the business, um, that's fine. That's your prerogative. It can be a lifestyle business. That's what we call them, where you enjoy what you do as you do, and you're not so concerned about selling it uh, to someone else. But it will be very hard to attract investors in that scenario because there needs to be an exit for them of some sort. And maybe you agree to buy them out at some stage or um, do something. But if you're an investor who wants to put money in normally time horizons three to five years, and that particular founder or that business owner has no intention on exiting, I'm a sort of captive investor that's never going to get their money back. So I feel that you have to be very clear with investors uh, about them uh, not seeing an early exit or any exit at this point. I hope that answers your question. And I think and it, it, it even put a point of clarification in a private chat to me in terms of it was, you know, so if we even take that example and pivot slightly, so what if you had a product to sell um, uh, to, you know, for example, realestate.com? So if you had a product to sell to realestate.com, uh, for example, um, they, I know for a fact realestate.com, they have their own tech guys, they have their own departments, they can generate any products and continue to, to build uh, technology on behalf of their business. I, I think you'd, you'd have to, it would be no different really than what I've explained. Uh, if you're going to sell a single product and pivot into that position where you're with, a, you want to make sure that you've got good long-term contracts, uh, that, that you've got no competes, and that uh, there aren't any easy triggers for you not to meet your uh, key milestones with, with that player. And so, um, look, if that's the position that you're, that you're wanting to get into, uh, and it's a big enough player that can generate enough revenue for the business, then I would say as long as you've got the right contracts in place and you can demonstrate that you're building value and increasing sales and turnover, then um, there's no problem with doing that. Thanks for that. I did I ask did privately, ask privately Tabitha, for, you know, for how we did with answering your question because it got a little bit jumbled up. But anyway, I think we're all good. Um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat box that, are, that relate to probably clarifications to what we talked last time. So could one of you actually just recap on what burn rate was and runway? Because when we use that language, it'd be... Okay, I'll take that one. Um, so what we talked about in our first session was around burn rate um, and runway. So the burn rate is effectively how much money you're burning on a monthly basis. And so if you've got $10,000 in the bank and you burn, you're spending $1,000 a month on expenses, your burn rate's $1,000 a month and your runway is 10 months. It's basically just how many months you've got until you run out of money. All right, good to taking that sip of water, Basil, because here we go. So Chris has asked, how do you value a business in the early stage? 
good market, good team, team good, technology, good technology, but only a only few a clients. Few clients. Well, it depends who's doing the valuation. <clears throat> Your valuation is always bigger than someone else's. But look, um, it's all about at a low base. Um, you know, typically when you when you look at a startup and you value it, there are so many components. And let's assume that you've got all the good things going for you, like team, business model. You can demonstrate scalability. What is your growth rate? So if we're going to build uh, this, this business up from a bottom-up valuation principle, how are you growing your product at the moment? Can you continue to grow at whatever rate it is? How do you generate leads? What's your conversion rate? And uh, how big is the market that you're penetrating? If you're growing quickly in a small target market, um, well, even if you get 100%, you're going to cap that business quickly or relatively quickly as if it was a much bigger market. And who are you competing with? Do you have a competitive advantage or disadvantage? And all of these things count in the valuation. But I would say in the first instance, um, when you've got anyone could argue that your company's worth nothing, um, most startups get out there at between one and a million and 1.6 million, depending on how good they are. And that's the line in the sand that they draw. And they give away 15 to 20% of their company in the first round. Um, and if they uh, have any issues over, you know, thinking that their valuation is should be more, they should really think about how they're going to get the second round away. So it's easy to overvalue your business in the first instance uh, and just say it should be 1.5 and you valued it at 4. It'll be very difficult to get the next round away when you're asking the next investors to come in at above 4 million. So be very careful about how you do this, how you link it. Valuations is important. And I'd say that it's based on your ability to demonstrate growth uh, with a few clients and then show how that you're going to increase that ability to scale. And then you can extrapolate those numbers and bring them back to a current, da uh, current day valuation. Thank you for that. And I think, Chris, we've probably done well with that question. Um, but there's a lovely follow-on from Colleen who has asked, how do we attract a good team member before we have enough money or funding to pay for their salary? I'll pick that one up. Uh, okay, so how I've always done it in my own companies, and we did this at Seek, um, which was one of the first companies I actually helped build. Um, all the good companies do the same thing. You effectively offer them options or equity in the company. Um, and that way you get to actually reduce the salary that gets paid. So I'll give you an example, um, computer share. So at computer share, if we had a software developer we wanted and the salary was $120,000 for the software developer, we'd offer them options in the company to roughly the same value as we discounted the salary. So if we said, look, we'll pay you 80,000 as a salary, we'd make up the difference in shares or options. And so that would effectively be about $40,000 worth of shares or options. Um, same thing at Seek and the same thing in my own companies. And so we've always found that it was best to actually not decrease the salary too much, just maybe a little bit. Uh, so maybe if it was 120,000, I'd probably say, well, we'll offer you 100000 as a salary and instead we'll give you a bonus. We'll give you another $50,000 worth of shares or, or options. And so I've always found that tends to work better. Um, and you might actually make them performance-based as well and say, look, we'll make those options or shares vest over a two- or three-year period and we'll give you a little bit more up front, but the, the, maybe the final 30% of it we'll give you over year two and then year three. All right, thank you for that. I do suspect that potentially Colleen's business might be a little bit smaller 
<laughs> and, and perhaps not have those those resources and all of that. So in in that sort of scenario, um, I would be basically if you're thinking about bringing on a founder or someone more significant in the business, um, then you can just offer them more. Uh, if you want to bring a co-founder on, you know, it could be anything up to fifty percent. Or you might have already advanced the business enough whereby you think 50% is too much value to give away. You've already been putting it together for two years. You might offer them something like 20% of equity in the company. But the one thing that I would actually reinforce is that you do actually make sure you have an agreement written up and that it is based on their performance. Um, I've seen too many companies where they've offered a co-founder or someone else coming into the company, look, I'll give you 20% or 30% of the company, uh, maybe even more, and then that person has not delivered. And they spend the next six months suffering the pain, or in some cases years, trying to get rid of that person that they've given maybe half of their company away to that's not doing very much. And so it's very, very important that you set the ground rules from the outset and the expectations on what you, how you want them to perform and what you want them to basically deliver. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, we've got a question from Ray. Basil mentioned the need for a clear foundation of understanding customers. Is customer experience research on customer needs slash pain points and customer defined value viewed by investors as valuable in the context of the product or service the entrepreneur is in love with? Yeah, good question. Absolutely. Um, just to put some context around your question, when startups come to us or historically companies have come to me for funding and if the customer is not at the center of our discussion and their pitch, um, we, are, we get very nervous. Everything that we do, whether it's from Northbridge Capital side or the startup side, it should always have the customer as the main focus because without customers, you don't have a business. And the more you know about your customer, the customer experience with existing products, your product, um, and essentially what they would want to see. So innovation is really about getting to know your customers well and understand what they would like in a product or service that they don't currently have. And that's as simple as innovation is. And most companies do customer experience uh, poorly. They think they know that their customers well, but they don't. And if you um, are trying to build a startup or a successful business, the more you can learn from your customer uh, the better. And customers aren't homogeneous. What you'll find is that some customers will, will want your product more than others. Um, some company, uh, customers will want uh, some features but won't want others. And that in each target market, um, your customer experience uh, is a little different and, and, the, and the requirements are different. So understand what your market looks like break it into segments go to those go to those people that are, that are using a product whether it's yours or someone else's and that's that in itself is a significant competitive advantage now it's not just startups that need to understand it kodak went broke because they didn't keep their finger on the pulse you know there are uh, multinational com com uh, companies with products and services that small companies can outcompete them on because they fail to look after their customers and to really understand what their customer experience is like. So I think that's a standout question. If you can, if you can um, demonstrate your knowledge of the customer in the market and their customer experience uh, in, through surveys in your um, pitch, then I think you'll go a long way to securing funding. Right. All right. Well, we've got, a, we've got a bit of a cheeky question from Bill. Bill has asked, what percentage of, an, of entrepreneurs do you invest in? Personally, less than one.
is that one out of ten, or is that one one out of a thousand? What a, you know? What's the quantum? How many How people many are out there are pitching ideas? ideas? Well, you asked about percentages. So if I saw a hundred deals, probably uh, out of a hundred, we'd really want to look at one or two. Um, and it really depends on how other investments are going. If we're fully invested and putting money into our well-performing investments and supporting them, then it's really hard to bring on early stage stuff unless we really love the people and, and love what they're doing. Oh, But it's different for everyone. I'll add to that quickly. Um, so what the process that we normally take at Northbridge Capital uh, is we don't approach this like most capital raising companies. We actually go through a process of once we have found a company that, you know, approaches us that we think we can work with and has a good product idea, uh, and of that, you know, we might see 20 companies, 30 companies in a month, and that, as Basil said, very few, 1%. And so we might actually only look at one company every two months. Um, and that one company, what we will then do is actually go through a process. It's not just go straight to capital raise. That's what most companies do with capital raising. You know, you'll go to them and say, hey, help when you raise capital, and they'll say, great, fantastic. How much do you want to raise? What's your valuation? And then they'll go and help them raise capital. But what we've found is that, the companies that take that sort of approach are not interested in the sort of investors that come into the companies that they're assisting. And so what we're interested in is actually going through a process of analysing your business over the period of about a month and putting together an action plan for your business that looks at all the things that needed to be uh, stepped up to the next level. Things like financials, things like understanding your customer, knowing the market in depth, looking at all the data that's in there and actually then putting all of that together and training the company that we're working with on pitching to investors so that when they get in front of those investors, they can actually close the deal rather than actually fumbling about with financials that aren't detailed, not understanding the customer properly and basically not doing a good job of presenting their business in the best possible light. And so that's what we do that's different. And so that's why when Basil said it's 1%, uh, it really is only 1% that sort of get to that point uh, and are willing to put in that sort of effort. And, that you know, it's required. If you don't do it, as Basil said in the presentation, it'll take you 18 months to raise capital. And that's because you get so many fails along the way in your presentation because you're not ready yet. So every time you get a knockback, you'll go away and you'll think about why you got that knockback and then you'll try and lift the quality of your presentation. But unless you've got someone to actually say, fix that up, don't do that, do do this, and then work through it with you, that process will take you more than a year. And Just I think that's the benefit of failing. Sorry, can Sorry. I just add Sorry. to what Brad said? Um, what's really important to understand is Brad, Brad and I started Northbridge because, one, we love technology. We've been on both sides of the table uh, for decades and built very successful businesses. Um, but we want to get more involved. Our, our, we really are passionate about technology, innovation, and seeing good people uh, outperform big companies. And so we live and breathe this. Um, so our strategy is, as Brad said, is very different. We have a three stage process. And one, the first stage is we get to know each other. We do a small piece of work for you uh, at a nominal cost. It actually costs us a lot more money, but we put in, put in that investment. And it really is quite a big investment from our, our point of view. Um, and at that point, um, our clients decide whether they stay with us or move, move on. Um, the next phase is phase two, where we all of the things that we found in phase one in our due diligence or our SWOT analysis, 
we build or underpin the foundations for them to get investment ready so that they can go out to the market on the front foot. Our, our clients don't go out there with their cap in hand saying, oh, please give us some money. We're really desperate. We haven't eaten anything but baked beans from us. We want our clients to go, hey, look at what we're doing. Um, this, is, this is our vision. This is our traction to date. We're really passionate. We've, we've made sure that we've got all the right people in the right places, and this is how we're going to move forward. And so we want to get them to shine against all the other um, startups in the marketplace looking for funding. And then it's not until that piece of work is done that we go out and raise capital because most of them won't raise capital if they haven't done this work. And so we'll take 12 months worth of work and put it into three months. Um, and so, for example, we've got a client now that we're working with. Our mandate to them was <clears throat> uh, 200 hours of our work. We've already put in close to double that, um, but we're enjoying it. That's, that's what we do. We're very selective. We only work with um, two to three companies a year. Um, so when you ask what do we invest in, we probably over-invest in the things that we like and we steer clear of the things that we're not prepared to put our sort of blood, sweat and, and tears into. Anyway, that's I uh, just thought I'd plug Northbridge Capital. Very good, Basil. Um, there was a cheeky question about um, about uh, consulting fee or percentage of, of funds raised, but um, I'll leave that offline. So we'll make sure that there's a uh, lots, Northbridge lots. Capital. Capital. <laughs> what was that? What was that? Lots. <laughs> Very good. Now, uh, uh, we have time for just one last question. Ray had a follow up question in terms of are investors interested in seeing how a product has been calibrated to customer needs? Definitely. Um, investors do actually want to see that sort of usability in the customer's hands. And it, I suppose it really depends what your product is, um, but I'll, I'll give you an example. So if your product is something that, you know, you might sell online, um, have you actually gone through the user experience? So have you actually stepped through what the user experience is for the particular product? Not just designing it and building it and putting it out there so they can access it, but when they use it, how do they use it? Is it a, is it a good experience for them? Can it be improved? Have you even looked at that? Because I see too many, too many people build product and just build it and they will come make the assumption that if I build it and I think it's fantastic as a founder, of course they're going to buy it. They're not going to buy it if you don't actually look at it from their perspective. And so that's really important and sort of you call that user experience. And whether or not that's a physical product um, or an online product, uh, it's the same thing. It's, it's what does the customer experience once they've purchased and when they're using your product? That last question, was it Ray? So, Ray, a, a, uh, a lot of fund managers, including Blackbird Capital, who are probably one of the most preeminent, um, you know, startup uh, investors in Australia, uh, one of their key criteria that they look at is, will the customer purchase a second time or multiple times, or if it's a single use product, will they refer it on to someone else? And so they wanna make sure that you're not having to make a new sale for every dollar. So your question is a good one, and it's all about product market fit and making sure that um, the, the product that you're giving the customer is exactly what they want at that price point and that they will continue to buy it uh, and refer it uh, in, in any case. And so if you're going to a VC or sophisticated investors, that is something that they will certainly look at. Ray added a point of clarification. She said, I'm asking 
as it can look like the company is unclear when what is actually happening is the company is calibrating the offer to customer defined value as uncovered in the customer experience research. Well, I think that was it for the questions. The Bill did have one last follow-up follow question in terms of, is the success rate really only 1%? One, uh, 1 uh, it's not so much the success rate as those companies that actually um, we choose to we choose to work with. Um, it's you know we'll probably sit down and go sit down and actually talk to and go through at least twenty companies in a month, and in some instances the companies' pitches might not be there yet. Everything might not be there yet but we're still willing to work with them and help them through the process. And so it's not just a factor of us going, well, we're only going to pick, you know, one company out. It's a matter of capacity and time for us as well. So what we do is when we've actually got three customers that we're, we're working with, we don't go, we don't look at any other companies. So we can put in the amount of time and effort that's required. So it's not just a matter of that many companies coming through and knock, knocking them all back. It's not how we work. We actually just look at how many companies can we physically work with at one time and give them 100%. And for us, that's no more than three companies at any one time. And that's what cuts the number down more than anything else. Because even if a company comes to us and pitches and the pitch isn't great and it needs work, if the business idea is good and they're confident and they want to go ahead with it, we'll help them get there. And that's what we help them do. So I hope that sort of clarified. I think that's good. All right, I think I'll go ahead and do do the wrap up. I think we're through with the questions. Most importantly, we also have the B3000 awards. The nominations are open um, and Northbridge Capital is also a category award sponsor for new business slash startup. So um, details once again are in that chat box um, or you certainly find them on our website, which is melbournebusinessnetwork.org.au. Um, and until next time, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Basil and Bradley. It was a brilliant, brilliant session. And we'll see everybody next time. Stay safe, stay well. Thank you.